Hi, everyone. Um, I think we're just about ready to get started. Uh, welcome. My name is Leah Taylor, and I am a research associate with the University of California Cooperative Extension. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for the third of four in our uh, fall 2020 invasive tree and forest pest webinar series. Uh, this series is made possible with funding provided by the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. Uh, normally, we would host these um, types of meetings in person and have a follow up field day. Um, so bear with us over this new platform of Zoom and um, online registration and all the great things that come with it. At the end of the webinar at 415, I will send a link in the chat box uh, to an anonymous feedback survey. We really encourage you all to fill in the feedback survey and let us know um, your thoughts and opinions about what was presented today. If you are applying for CEUs, as I know a lot of you are, um, at the end of the feedback survey will be a follow-up link to your CEU quiz and application. There's 15 questions on the application, on the quiz part, um, after you fill in your name and your license number. And there's no time limit. There are um, as many retakes as you wish. Um, what else did I? Um, yeah, so perfect. Anyway, so um, that should be good for CEUs. Um, if you have questions, please let me know. I've gotten quite a few about the other two um, webinar series. So if you've taken those and this one, um, we're happy to have you and I'll follow up um, if I haven't already about your CEU certificates. Um, so what we're really here for today is to hear about the latest research and distribution and management strategies for um, invasive shot hole borers and fusarium dieback from Dr. Beatrice Nobua Behrman. Um, she is an urban forestry and natural resources advisor for the University of California Cooperative Extension in Orange County. And we are really grateful to have her here today uh, virtually. As she presents her information, um, please put any questions in the chat box or um, utilize the Q&A function of Zoom. And we'll collect those at the end um, for her to go over <laughs> for all of us. So with that, uh, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Bea, for being here today and um, take it away. Thanks, Leah. Thanks for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. To see you all, and um, yeah, we'll start today. Um, as I yeah, previously said, the idea today is I'm going to go over what this pest is about um, and um, basically explain what the latest management strategies are based on what we've been learning from. Some things are come from um, research, some others come from trial and errors, and so some mistakes we've done, and then we learn from those. So um, hope this is uh, full of good information for all of you. Uh, I'm pretty excited. There's like almost 200 people over here. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, so let's just get started. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, I will talk a little bit about the biology of this pest, then the distribution and impact. Um, I'm going to go over how to identify the symptoms of an infestation, and then we'll just dive into best management practices and what we've been learning throughout these years. But just to start, I'd like to know more or less where you guys are um, standing regarding to invasive shahol borers and invasive shahol borer management. So I'm going to start with a poll for all of you. And I'd like you to, in this poll, um, tell me if basically if you have no previous training or no experience, you have some training in the past, but not no personal experience of you applying that knowledge, you do or did manage shahol borer infestation, but you never got formal training, or you got both the training and the experience. So kind of um, let me know which one of these four options uh, better you better identify with. 
Oh. So we'll wait on a little bit. Um, Leah, I cannot, I cannot tell how many people are answering in my screen. So maybe you can tell whenever it just sort of tapers down and or more than 80% answer, then we can close it. So okay. give people a couple of more seconds. There, can you see that? I cannot see it. Let's see. Can everyone else see those results? Can they? Anyone? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I don't see them. <laughs> uh, let's see. Share. Uh, how about oh, there now? you go. There you are. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> great, great, great. All right, thank you. Okay, so we have nice. So uh, about thirty percent of you have no experience whatsoever. So hopefully this will be a good introduction to it. Um, some people had trainings in the past. Um, very few have been managing without any formal training and about 22% have both. So I think most of you have been having some training, but didn't have to deal with the pest yourself. So we'll just, um, hopefully this will help you just, you know, review what you've learned before and give you a new um, view on the things that we can do to manage this pest. So, We'll start with then who are these invasive shot hoppers? So they are these teeny tiny beetles. So this is a penny. And as you can see, they're not much longer or bigger than Lincoln's nose. Uh, females are a little bit bigger than males. Uh, and so these beetles attack trees, as we say, right? But there's more to it than that. There is, uh, as we know right now, there's four different species of invasive shaho borers. And of those, these two, the Colifago shaho borer and the Kuroshio shaho borer are present in California. What happens is this is called um, a species complex because all of these species of, or subspecies are morphologically indistinguishable. Even if you're an entomologist and you're looking at them under a microscope, no way to tell them apart, only by DNA testing. And that's what we call a cryptic species, right? So are different species, but they're cryptic because they just all look like one. And that's why um, even though we're working with several species, and in the case of California with two different species, we group them into what we call the invasive shaho borders because we can't distinguish them and also the way they attack trees and, and their modus operandi in a way is uh, the same or so similar that we would use the same management practices. But also you've probably heard of this uh, term insect disease complex. So invasive shareholders don't come alone, they come with a disease called Fusarium diabetes. So when we talk about insect disease complex, we talk about an insect vector of the disease, which will be the invasive shaho borers, all of them, and a fungal disease, which is Fusarium dieback. Fusarium dieback is caused by a fungus from the genus Fusarium. Each of these uh, species uh, brings a different species of Fusarium with them. Uh, so that's another way we can distinguish between species or groups of species is by identifying the fungus that is associated with them. And these beetles and this fungus have a very close symbiotic relationship. So the fungus needs the beetle to get into the tree and the beetles need the fungus because they use the fun this fungi as their sole source of uh, food. They don't eat wood like other beetles might, they just eat fungus. So the way um, that life cycle and infestation works is we have, we saw here, 
to the bottom left with a mated female that's carrying the fungal spores. So these beetles have some specialized pockets in the back of their head, close to their mandibule base, uh, which are called mitangia. And in those pockets, they store um, the fungi, the spores from the fungi. So when they disperse, they bring their food with them. So this female finds a suitable host and she then starts digging a gallery into the host until she reaches the cambium. In that gallery, she will put, um, in the walls of the gallery, she will place the spores. So it, it will be, the fungus will be growing in the um, walls of the gallery. And then she will lay her eggs, which are mostly females and a few males. And once the larvae hatches, they will all feed exclusively on the fungi until they grow up and become adults. And then the kinky part of the story, males and female siblings will mix with each other inside those galleries. And then the females will be ready to go and start their life cycle again. And this, um, this detail that the males and females breed or mate within the galleries is very important part of their life cycle for, for us managers because that means that the beetles, when they disperse, they're not looking for a mate. They're not using pheromones to attract other beetles because they already made it. And so that makes it a lot harder to control. So with other kinds of insects and beetles, we use pheromones to attract them to trap, but that won't work in this case. Um, so what happens now with the tree? So in here we have the gallery, the arrow is showing the entrance of the gallery. This is a, a transversal, cut, transversal cut of a branch. So we have the gallery, reach the cambium and then basically expands to the sides. And the beetle just lay the fungal spores in the, um, the walls of these galleries, but the fungus infects beyond the gallery. So all this area, all this area that is, there, that is marked in there is colonized by the fungus. What happens is that the tree reacts to this disease, to this infestation, right? To the fungal infestation. And the way the tree reacts is the tree will block the vessels just in an attempt to uh, compartmentalize that area and like basically keep that fungus in that particular area. It's just not allowing it to move in, in colonize other parts of the tree, which seems like a good strategy. However, if you look at this, once we have more than one, once we have more beetles making their galleries around the trunk, that means that the tree will be blocking all the vessels around here and then blocking all the vessels around there. So eventually, if you have enough beetles attacking that tree, the defense mechanism from the tree is gonna go bite them in the tail, right? It's going to, uh, now the tree has their whole vascular system in a way uh, compromised. And that will result in what we call um, dieback, right? Because there's no movement of water and nutrients that goes up to this side of the tree. When we have a strong enough infestation or severely enough infestation, this can cause, and depending on the tree species, this can cause the death of the tree. So how do we, how does that happen? How do we get to have so many um, beetle, beetles attacking a tree that that will make the tree get their um, vascular system compromised? Well, even though each beetle is small, we can have really a lot, lot, lot of beetles in a tree. And the way that works is that most of the beetles that come out of those galleries, the, the daughters of that initial uh, beetle, 
instead of dispersing, most of them will make their own galleries in the same tree where they were born. And so if we, let's just assume that we start with one female attacking a tree, and then from that, that female, five daughters will survive. That gives us about 10 or 20% survival. They can lay between 30 to 50 eggs. So just being, let's say, five to 20% of them survive and become uh, adults ready to go out. That means that if we start with one female here and five daughters survive and they colonize the same tree, and then from each of those five, five daughters survive and colonize the tree and so on and so on. And at the beginning, we don't see a big change, right? And that's what happens. In the beginning, the tree doesn't look so bad. There's some holes in there, eh, whatever. And then all of a sudden, in a couple of generations, we end up having almost 100,000 beetles in a tree. And that's in as little as seven generations. And just to give you an idea, the number of generations per year change depending on the temperature, but in here in Southern California, you can have about three to four generations per year. So this is a scenario, this is uh, in this, this is a theoretical scenario, but it's just a very possible to happen in the, in two years, right? So a tree could end up covered in holes and with a vascular system compromised in about two years. For some species of tree, that can happen a lot faster, and for others, a lot slower. So um, let's go to a little bit of a check on another poll. So what kind of agent is the cause of the Fusarium dieback, the disease Fusarium dieback? Is it a virus, is it a, fungi, a fungus, or is it a bacteria? Let's see if we can get that poll up. We should all be able to see it now. Yeah, I can see it. Hopefully everyone else. That's an easy one. Just, just, just see if you're paying attention or playing solitary. All right, perfect. So most of you answer correctly. It's the fungus, right? It's a fungal disease that causes fusarium dieback. And so now we're going to go to the next poll, which is a little bit uh, slightly more complicated. So that, how does that fungus that causes the fusarium dieback get into the tree? Either the beetles bring the spores with them in some specialized structures that they have because they use the fungus as a food source. The beetles accidentally transport the fungal spores attached to their bodies just because they're there. Or the fungal spores are in the environment and they enter the tree through the wounds that the beetles cause. So. If a few more minutes, uh, seconds, I mean. All right. And most of you answer that correctly. The beetles are bringing the fungus with them, basically on purpose, right? They need the fungus as a food source. So the beetle without the fungus cannot survive. And the fungus needs the beetle to bring it into the tree, right? In um, intended, and basically these beetles are some kind of gardeners, right? They have this fungal garden that they keep in there inside their gallery. So there's um, many hosts that are susceptible to um, invasive shahoboras and fusarium dieback. 
Uh, there's actually 64, 65 different species that we have identified here in California as reproductive hosts. So when we talk about reproductive hosts, we're, we're talking about those species of tree that can, where the beetle can grow the fungus and complete their life cycle. Beetles might try to, affect, to attack other trees that are not hosts and they will fail. So we only consider them reproductive hosts if the beetles can grow their fungus and reproduce and complete their life cycle in that tree. So a reproductive host makes more beetles in a way. And of those 65 reproductive hosts that we know of in California, they are not all equally susceptible. So this uh, 15 species that I'm uh, showing you right here are uh, what we consider the very susceptible hosts, right? Uh, we've seen very often that the infestation by invasive Shahobaris and Fusarium diva causes a tree death. Uh, and that includes several maple trees, uh, particularly uh, the box elder, which is right now the, the most susceptible species of them all. Uh, this, the box elder is uh, very preferred, very susceptible. It can die in a few months. Um, so it's very important if you have box elders in your property or the property you're managing to keep a close eye on that particular species. But also we have others, um, including a lot of California natives, um, like the sycamore, uh, the cottonwood, um, a lot of the, the poplars, some oaks, like the valley oak and the English oak are quite susceptible. Um, the castor bean, which I'm totally okay with it dying, um, because it's a weed, but we don't want it to become a source of more beetles. So we control the castor bean. We actually control two problems at the same time. And then um, a lot of the willows are heavily susceptible to this um, pest disease complex. These are the other um, species that are also reproductive hosts but they are less susceptible. So we haven't seen them die specifically because of this infestation. And they usually, the beetles tend to colonize the margin of cankered uh, branches. Um, so if the tree is not infested with a canker, uh, it usually manages to fight the beetle and not allow the beetle to reproduce in it. But whenever wherever the tree has a canker branch, the beetle can um, colonize successfully right in the margin of, of the canker tissue. So especially with all these other species, having a close eye checking on the canker branches and the canker infestations and looking for signs of the beetles there is uh, key to find if they are infested or not. Um, I'm not, you're not going to have to commit this, nobody, to memory right now, but you know you can visit ishb.org and we keep the full list of reproductive hosts in California um, actually up, pretty up to date over there. So these beetles are native to Southeast Asia and they are invasive, not only here, but in other parts of the world. So we found them in Israel, we found them in South Africa, they are in um, here in California, in Florida. We have uh, one of the species of the complex, the Tisha hopper. So um, in Hawaii, we have both the Tisha hopper and the Tulufega hopper. We have found it in Mexico. We found it in other parts of Central America and in many places in Asia. So it's it, we found it in several places, but. The species that they manage to um, infest is slightly different in different areas. Overall, worldwide, they can actually attack up to 400 different species of trees. In California, we only seen them in those 65. And here in California, they're concentrated in um, Southern California. So as I 
told you before, there's two species, right? The Polyphagus shahu border and the Kurosio shahu border. Uh, in red, we can see the places where we've found uh, and actually confirmed by DNA analysis uh, infestations by Polyphagus shahu border. Uh, so we have Los Angeles, Orange County, Riverside County, um, Ventura County, San Bernardino County. Um, they are uh, they are some in Santa Barbara as well. Um, we can find Polyphago Shaho border, and uh, the Corocio Shaho border. We found it, and especially in San Diego County, uh, it's an infestation that started a little bit later. So the first infestation of Polyphago was in 2012, and the first infestation that we found of Corocio was in 2014. And then we found it in uh, some areas in Orange County and then Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo. So um, this kind of jump of Kurosio uh, shot hope gives us the idea that these beetles are moving thanks to something else than their own flight. Um, and this is probably related to the movement of firewood and or uh, green waste. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Just talking about what kind of impact it can have. So the worst case of um, the worst impact I've seen of invasive shaho borders was Kurosio shaho border in the Tijuana River Valley. So this was pretty strong. So from it attacked this area um, the, that was full of willows and very fast in only nine months it went from this to this. Uh, this is after Kurosio Shaho were killed all these trees and then a storm sort of broke all the branches. Uh, but in this case, in this particular setting, what happened later is that slowly but surely those uh, willows were re-sprouting, even though there's a lot of other things that also sprouted, like Arundo, um, that are invasive that were using that open space to re-sprout. But eventually, in a few years, that um, those willows sort of recovered. And because there was such a dip in the amount of borders, so once you go from A to B, in the second case, there's no more host available for these beetles. So the numbers of beetles around also crash, right? Because they kill all their hosts. So now by August 2019, their infestation in the area is not that bad and the willows managed to re-sprout. So that gives us some hope, especially for these air natural areas that have this fast growing, easily re-sprouting uh, species like um, this willow. But in the um, urban areas, the picture is a little bit harsher because, um, well, when we have heavily infested trees, those trees need to be removed. And so this is what happened in like in Eagle Regional Park in 2016, where they have a very heavy infestation. And this park had a lot of sycamores, which got super heavily infested and became hazards. And so they had to remove nearly 500 trees in this park. And as you can see, the amount of vegetation cover in this park dropped dramatically, drastically. And in this case, we're not having any risk sprout. And so the effect of these beetles on our urban forest is actually pretty dramatic. So better to get to it early and prevent this kind of disasters from happening. And that's why we're just going to work into how to identify the symptoms of this uh, pest and then how to manage right away when we have, uh, when we learn that we have an infestation. So just to recap, I'm gonna launch the, this poll asking, okay, uh, what are the ISHV um, Fusarium diba, who's reproductive host. Are there any tree species that get gets attacked by shahu borer? 
are those tree species that are highly susceptible and they die because of shallow bore damage? Or are those tree species in which the beetles can grow their fungus and complete their life cycle? I want this to be very clear because um, the, this, uh, this distinction between what is a reproductive host or not is very important for management. All right, let's see. Perfect, so most of you answered correctly. So it's those species in which the beetles can grow their fungus and complete their life cycle. So those are the ones that we are going to put the most effort, right? Okay, we'll close this and keep going then. So as I said, one of the main things is just identifying when we have an infestation. And these beetles are teeny tiny, and I, basically you will rarely see them, right? They spend most of their lives inside the trees. So more than focusing in finding the beetle and identifying the beetle, what we can do is identify the symptoms of the tree when it gets infested with the beetle and the fungus. So, the signs and symptoms of the infestation is uh, an entry hole, right? And that's the main sign that there's whoops, shallow borders in this um, tree. So, but just not any entry hole would be a sign of shallow borders. So it has to be, the, basically it's about 0.85 millimeters in diameter, which just for, to be, make it more easy, is about the size of the tip of a medium ballpoint pen. And this hole is perfectly round, like a shot hole. And sometimes um, you can even see the beetles. The females like to just hang around in the entrance of, a, of their gallery and stick their abdomen out. So that shiny thing that you see there is actually the female just sticking her abdomen out of the hole. That is, if you see the female, that's a really good sign because um, most other beetles don't behave like that. Uh, but even if you don't see it, we're just looking for that perfectly round hole the size of a medium ballpoint pen. Now, the next thing I would definitely encourage you to do to make sure you have shallow border and is to shave the first layer of the bark and so you can expose the hole better. So in many cases, the hole is covered with some gunk and uh, or the bark is rough and you won't see the hole as nicely as in here, which is what happens on sycamores. But if you uh, take a little knife and basically shave the first layer of the bark, you will be exposing again the entry hole or the gallery and you'll see the shape and the size even better. And then you'll be able to see this dark colored um, tissue surrounding the hole. And that's the tissue that is infected with um, fusarium and this basically dead tissue. And then there's a live tissue around. So um, finding the hole surrounded by darkened tissue and then live tissue, that's way uh, like a more strong evidence that this is invasive shahol board. So there's other things you can see in the trees. So a lot of trees uh, show staining associated with the holes. Um, you know, it's like how the tree reacts to anything that is harming them. You can see other trees uh, gum when they get um, attacked. Other trees like um, 
the avocado trees, they have this sugary exudate and they form this kind of sugar volcanoes. And some sign of the beetle is this uh, frass or sawdust that the beetles push out when they're digging their gallery. Because remember, they're not eating the, the wood, they're just digging the gallery and eating the fungi that they grow inside. So the presence of any of these other signs and symptoms can also be used as an idea of, okay, there's, um, there's beetles in here. However, because this is related to a lot of the times any tree will react like this to any kind of injury, um, always when we find this kind of symptoms, we need to shave the bark and expose again the entry hole with the darkened tissue around. If we don't see the entry hole, I would not consider that an, a tree infested with ISHBFD. I, this, it could be many other things. So use this as a guidance. If I see staining, if I see gumming, sugary exudates, okay, I'm gonna go and check and then shave the bark and see if actually I can see that entry hole. And the thing is that the symptoms might vary uh, depending on the species. So different species of trees are going to show different symptoms or even the same symptom, which is staining, might look kind of different in each species of tree. So it's, uh, you know, it's just like realizing that something is wrong with a tree and then going looking closer. And if I have to check some species before others, in my experience here in Orange County, um, the trees that get more infested and faster are the box elder, of course, um, that's the, the preferred host. But then the sycamores and the willows are trees that usually show uh, symptoms of infestation even at low levels of um, beetle pressure. Um, I'll put cottonwoods also probably in that category as well. So let's do a check. So if a tree shows wet staining, gumming, and or sugar volcanoes. Does that mean it's infested with invasive Shahoboris and Fusarium diva? Options are yes, because those are all symptoms of ISHB infestation. Maybe, but I will need to look closer or definitely no. What do you guys think? Wait a minute. Get that. And again, most of you answer correctly. But the answer is maybe, but I need to look closer, right? I need to go and see if there is an entry hole the size of a medium ballpoint pen and perfectly round. If I don't see that, I cannot say that that, be, that tree is infested with shahoe borer. So now we're gonna dive into best management practices. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about monitoring, management options, how to dispose correctly of infested material, and we're gonna dive into management decision tools. So I'd like to know for you, which aspect of the management are you guys more curious about? How to know if an area is infested, uh, treatment options, tools to make management decisions, how to prevent infestations, or maybe all of it. So just, just to have an idea of what is it that my public wants. May I just want to give you a, about a 20 minute warning. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Okay, so most of you said all of it. Okay, and a lot of the next one is treatment and options. All right, so let's dive into that. Let's close this. Okay, so for monitoring or knowing if you have an infestation, we're talking about visual inspection of trees and trapping. So the visual inspection is always the best uh, approach. So that's how you're going to find uh bear infestations early. And the way we assess infestation in trees is we um, consider how many active entry holes and how much dieback we have, or if we observe dieback or not. So less than 50 exit holes or entry exit holes we consider is low. Between 50 and 150 is a moderate infestation. But then one more than 150, we're talking about a heavy infestation. And if it has dieback, we're considering that a severe infestation. And we're talking about active entry holes. So all entry holes or entry holes that are not active means that there's no light bills in them will not count. And that's a little bit hard sometimes to tell. But a good test if you can access the entry hole is to use the paint test. So we just cover the suspected entry hole with just water-based latex paint. And then if the beetle is alive inside that hole, she would, in a matter of hours, uh, sometimes minutes, reopen that entry hole because she wants that open. So that is a good test um, to see if what we're seeing are all holes that have been already dealt with and with the beetles don't live there anymore, or we're talking about active holes. Usually active holes also show some weeping or some sawdust coming out. So that's another way of confirming that that's an active infestation. And for trapping, there's several options. Uh, we usually use uh, either funnel traps or this um, beetle panel trap, or what we call sticky traps. And in both cases, we use a lure called quercivoral. This is a weak lure, uh, so it's not going to attract beetles to your um, um, your property or the property you're managing. It will just only attract them if they're around, and you just know if you have beetles or not. So it's a good option just to um, check if you have beetles or not and if you cannot do um, visual inspections on all of your trees. Um, so this trap will help you know if you have infestation, but you cannot use them as, um, as a control method because as I said, the lure is pretty weak, it's not a pheromone, so they won't attract as many beetles as to kill all the beetles in your area. We can also use the traps just to check when the flight periods are happening and time our treatments to those uh, flight periods. So usually we have a peak in the number of beetles trapped in spring, and another peak in the fall. So those are the moments where if you're going to do a trunk spray, that's where you want to do it. Uh, but as you can see, it varies with different locations and sometimes with also different years. So keeping a trapping program in your location is actually a pretty good idea. So just to wrap this up, which of these are good uses of shaho for a trap? As a control method, uh, you can click as many as you want to monitor or inc uh, the increase or decline of shahopper populations in the area, to detect new infestations, and to time treatments. Which ones of these are good uses of the trap? Let's have a few more seconds. Do we have enough? Um, yeah, there you go. All right, so 
Perfect. So most of you answered that all those three last options, the monitoring, the detecting new infestations, and the time treatments, those are all good uses of the traps. As a control method, it won't work. Now, um, for management, one of the first things we can do if the infestation is located in just a single branch, uh, we can prune that branch, right? And that's a really good way of getting rid of that um, that infested that location that focus of infestation. There you go. Um, when you do that, make always make sure you disinfect your pruning tools after, so you don't. Um, end up inoculating other plants with a Clostarium fungus. That, for that, you can use alcohol, 70% um, solution, 5% uh, solution of bleach or lysol. So now if we're talking about chemical treatments, which a lot of you were interested in. The main thing is to treat only those trees that are infested. There's no control, um, there's no method that we can um, that we know that it works as a um, preventative method. So the best thing to do is to inspect all of your trees, find the trees. When one of the trees gets infested, then you'll find it. Then you will treat that tree that is infested and keep inspecting the rest of the trees and only treat them once they get infested. And for that, for those treatments, we the things that we found uh, that work are um, combinations of insecticides and fungicides. Um, there's different options depending on what, um, what the situation of your trees. So we have trunk sprays with bifenthrin and bacillus subtilis, uh, systemic soil injections or soil drench with immunocropriates, Trunk injections with a mamectin benzoate and tebiconazole or protoconazole, and based on trunk sprays with dinotefiron, which we had mixed results with that. Some, some cases it worked, and in some cases we didn't find much difference. And again, this depends on where the tree is located, uh, your budget, your, if it's close to the water, then you won't be able to do trunk sprays, uh, but in many cases that would be the easiest way. There's repellents that are being tested, like verbenone and piperiton. Um, and then there's biological control that is still under research. And those are what we're talking about, medium and long-term solutions. So the main idea is do not uh, wait and do nothing and wait for that biological control to come because that's gonna take some time. You might have to use chemical control to keep your trees uh, alive until we get uh, either uh, a natural enemy or an entomopathogenic fungus or um, nematodes, uh, you know, tackle down as a control method. So what happens with the severely infested trees? Those are the trees that we call amplifier trees, right? Trees that have more than 150 entry holes and they show signs of dieback. Those are big sources of beetles. Remember, they can have like 100,000 beetles in them. And they also can become hazards because their branches become very brittle. So in those cases, uh, removal of these trees is what we uh, propose as a best management practice. Um, so in general, um, the removal of the tree should be followed by a thumb removal, so because the beetles can still grow in the stumps. And what happens when that doesn't happen? So this is an example of Irving Regional Park in Orange County. And in January 2018, we found a bunch of like 94 infested trees, but three of those were heavily or severely infested trees. And uh, for one reason or the other, those trees did not get removed right away. And what happened is by the next cycle, which was by November, the number of infested trees grew exponentially to 316 um, and uh, with 15 now amplifier trees in the area. So we were keeping this, this um, part kind of 
under control, not very heavily infested. But once those trees were not removed timely, the infestation grew really, really fast. So timely removal of those amplified trees is very important. So is it possible to treat Shahobori infested trees? Is only preventatively? Yes, especially if the infestation levels are low or not. The only solution is to remove the tree. What do you guys think? Right, perfect. So most of you answer correctly. Yes, especially if the infestation levels are no are low. Sorry. In one more question, why should we consider removing amplifier trees or severely infested trees? Should be to protect the rest of the trees since it's a big source of beetles. To protect people and property from hazardous branches. To remove potential fire fuel, or all of the above. That was an easy question. And correctly, most of you answered all of the above. All of those are good reasons why removing amplifier trees is recommended, especially in um, urban setting. So what are we going to do with a infested plant material once we're removing a branch or removing a tree? Well, the options for um, dealing with that is chipping it. If we chip it to um, less than one inch, that will kill almost all the beetles. And if we chip it to less than three inches, that will kill 98% of the beetles. But then if we want to get rid of all the beetles, we can chip and solarize or compost it, those chips. Or we can uh, solarize or kiln dry the log. But always, always, if you're moving the load from one place to another, you need to cover it so the beetles don't spread uh, while you're moving uh, infested wood from one place to the other. So this is a lot of extra work, right? And it's expensive and it's time consuming. So why should I bother? Well, uh, the thing that we found is that green waste is one of the major pathways for shahobori dispersion. Um, so in this example, uh, heavily infested trees were removed from one, uh, from somewhere. They were chipped to big chips, like more than three to five inches and then brought to an area to be used as mulch without being treated first. And we learned about that and we collected some buckets of chips and then um, we just put it in this emergent cages. And what we found is that one beetle per gallon of chips um, of heavily infested wood was um, was coming out of those chips, right? So a beetle per gallon, if you think about it, um, like every, um, every like the, the amount of buckets of, of gallons that you're gonna need uh, for just using a mulch, uh, that would just mean like maybe hundreds of thousands of beetles potentially coming out of that area. If uh, we put traps in there and we also found a bunch of beetles emerging or a bunch of beetles in those traps right, right after um, the chips were laid. So it's very dangerous to just not do anything with those, just not chipping or chipping it big and not do any treatments with those chips. And the other thing is that if you, the other pathway that we'll find is firewood, right? So we know that um, firewood is a ma major pathway for many pests. And if you leave those trunks somewhere 
someone will probably grab them, put them in their convertible and bring them to their house and, and bring that pest with them. So as a general rule, do not ever move firewood or we also say buy it when you burn it. And um, so you don't bring pests from one place to another. So why, just that one of the last polls is why is proper disposal of infested materials so important? Um, is it because it's illegal to move infested wood? Is it because firewood and greenways are pathways for shadow border dispersion to new areas? Or is it because chipping the wood is the only way to get rid of the shadow border? All right, perfect. We don't, we need to make sure that green waste and firewood are not moved without being properly um, managed before because they're pathways for this pest and other pests as well. Um, so for, to finish with it, uh, with this, uh, the factors that we should consider when we're thinking about management and what are we going to do is, uh, Think if the tree is a reproductive host or not, the infestation level of the tree, the value of the tree, like if it's a big tree, is it a small tree, is it big economic or cultural value, and the hazard level, right? If it's a tree that is kind of dying and it's leaning against the sidewalk, that's a big hazard. And this is an example of the kind of management matrix that we developed for um, Urban, the urban forest, and this can be man, um, just modified depending on your needs. But basically, for um, the for each of the kind of high value or low value tree, depending if it's a reproductive host or not. If it's not a reproductive host in general, we just recommend to monitor and just do nothing unless you find them heavily infested, and then we might think this is a new reproductive host that we didn't know about. Um, and then for low value trees, usually sometimes that removal or removal of the branches is something that um, is generally recommended. But for high value trees, you might start treating when the infestation is low. And then um, of course, just more, um, the heavily infested trees need to um, be removed. So, the, um, just to give you some other resources, uh, ishb.org, you can find this and more information. There's uh, online training that you can take. There's uh, ISHB detection assessment tool that you can use. And um, just to, before we finish, just to give a link to another pest that I was asked to uh, let you guys know about, um, I want to, just bring you awareness to the Mediterranean oak borer, which is another uh, of the cousin closely related to the shahu borer that was found in Napa County and is now being recently found in Sacramento. Um, and is attacking uh, valley oaks and blue oaks. And so, um, and it's a vector of other several pathogenic fungi as well. So if you find this kind of galleries, Trellis like galleries, and you have dieback in your oaks. Um, please be aware of that. Um, make sure you manage your the wood that comes out of those um, dead branches and dead trees. But especially if you suspect that there is a tree in your, if you are in that northern California area, you have a valley oak that is looking pretty bad, and you suspect it's a Mediterranean oak border please contact either your Act Commissioner's Office, your UCCE Office, or you can also call CDFA's Pest Hotline. Um, so we would love to go take a look and probably help you with that tree and you can help us um, learn more about this new pest. Also, we have a website, mlbpc.org, where you can get more information. So with that, I'm going to leave you here my contact information and remind you of our website here at ishb.org 
and I can take any questions that you guys have. Great, thank you so very much, um, Randall. If you will unmute yourself, um, we have quite a few questions collected for you. All right. Okay, thank you, Dr. Navarro Berman. Um, you actually did a pretty fantastic job of answering questions as you were going along. Um, one interesting question <laughs> is, um, why is it called polyphagus when it only consumes a select fungus? That's a good question. Well, um, yeah, so just to recap, polyphagus means poly, many phagus uh, food or eating. So polyphagus means eat many things. And you're right, um, the, the beetle only eats one thing, which is the fungus, but I think the reason why it was called polyphagus originally is because we didn't know about that. And we see that it attacks many different species of tree, right? And originally, because a lot of these beetles actually feed on the tree, they were like, oh, it eats many things, it eats many trees. Um, later on, when we discovered that it just eats the fungus, and it's actually the one that's polyphagus is the fungi, right? But we already stuck with the name, so. We just went with it. <laughs> um, you talked about how the, the fungus is introduced to the trees. Um, is there something about the structure of the galleries or what the beetles do that um, supports the fungal growth? Yeah, so that the beetles do two things, right? First, they actually physically bring the fungal spores into the tree. So they are, um, you know, just doing the initial inoculation. But also it's thought that the, the beetles are somewhat tending to the fungi inside the gallery. So um, they are in a way farming the fungus so it, it just stays healthy and, and good for their food source. Um, we just got another question related to this. Is there a way we can support the tree's ability to block the infestation of the fungus? Well, when the infestation is low, um, the, a lot of the trees, if the tree is healthy, the tree might be able to compartmentalize around the, um, the hole in the gallery and sort of basically choke that, and so the Fungus cannot grow, cannot go farther away, and the beetle doesn't have enough food and just, you know, compartmentalize that area and in a way getting rid of the beetle uh, or not allowing the beetles to, to increase their population. So that is something that I've seen and I've seen quite a bunch lately um, in some areas. And it's something that works if the trees are healthy and if the beetle pressure is low. And by that, I mean, if there's not a lot of beetles flying and trying to attack the tree at once. So if your infestation levels overall are low, there's more chances that the tree will, you know, fight infestation. If the infestation, if the numbers of beetles around are high, there's less chances that that will happen. And on the other hand, the other thing is that the difference species of tree might be better or worse at, at doing that. So if we're talking about the trees that are not highly susceptible, that's also one of the reasons why they're not highly susceptible because they are pretty good at compartmentalizing and fighting the beetle. The trees that are highly susceptible, that's a little bit harder. So some of them might be able to fight low infestations um, and some others might not. So it's a little bit more of a gamble there. You listed the uh, trees that are, are host um, trees. Um, doesn't appear ornamentals are in there, things like carrot wood, prunus, jacaranda. Um, are those susceptible? Yes. Uh, I heard carrot wood, jacaranda, those two are susceptible. What's the other one? It's prunus, I, I, I guess a prune tree. Oh, no, um, prune trees, we haven't seen 
Um, yeah, we haven't seen those. Uh, but jacarandas in, and carrot wood, yes, they are susceptible. They're on the group of not very heavily or very susceptible ones. Actually, both of them usually have shahobor infestations only when they um, it's associated with a canker infestation. So in most of those, so if you find a branch that is infested with canker, like a which is a fungal disease, the that tissue that is like that border in between the cankered and healthy tissue, that's where the shahobors are able to colonize. So as I said, those those trees that are in the second list are sort of better at defending. So they can get colonized with shahobor when they are already fighting something else, so they're weak. And it's kind of like when we have are sick with something and then we get a worse disease, you know, that normally we'll be able to fight it, but because we're fighting something else, our, our immune system cannot take both of them. This is kind of the same idea. Is there any kind of a theory as, as to why the beetles uh, reproduce in some trees and not others? Uh, it's a mixture of the how good the tree is at defending himself and then how good of an environment this is for the fungus to grow, right? So um, there's, uh, it, it's, it's probably a combination of the tree responding and uh, with compartmentalization, but also their secondary compounds that the trees might have that the beetles, the fungus, sorry, cannot uh, metabol metabolize those and it's actually bad for them. You know, like um, uh, tannins could be something that deters some pests. But in this case, um, you know, different um, secondary compounds that the tree might have could be um, helping them survive or helping them kill or not let the fungus to grow nicely. Um, the other thing, um, gumming, trees of gum are usually a lot better at defending themselves just because the gum sort of pushes the beetle and the fungus out. And that's our, some mechanism. So some, some trees have better defense mechanisms for this particular pest than others. So somebody's asking about gumming, does that entomb or uh, can you repeat that? Uh, you're just coming a little bit choppy. The beetles spread. Uh, I didn't hear you, and, Randall. Yeah. I think you may have froze. Um, there's a couple more questions Ooh. in the chat. Let me see where he's left off. Oh, okay. Let's see. There does dieback occur only when there is a severe infestation. Um, in general, yes. Uh, so if you, it's kind of the other way around. If there's more than 150 entry holes and you see dieback, that's considered severe. But you can have a little bit of dieback if the infestation is maybe concentrated in a branch, and it might not be. Uh, that many beetle holes in that branch and you still have some dieback. Um, in those cases, you might want to just remove the branch, right? And that, that's, that's again, there's, there's a lot of, uh, nothing is black or white. Like, oh, that tree has more than 150, just remove it. It's, you know, you just still have to use your sense your common sense is like it's all in one branch just to get rid of that branch and you can just keep the tree so so those are things that you have to consider and not and not everything is black or white okay can you hear me now <laughs> yes. yes okay so a question related to that is um, uh, when you're counting the level of infestations do you count beetle holes all over the tree or just in one location like chest high that is a great question. Um, overall, we counted in the whole tree. We just checked in the whole tree, but um, this uh, 
method that we or this um i say um tiers that we decide from low moderate or severely are number of beetles in one stem uh so so you can have if you have more than 150 in one stem that will be like a heavily infected tree um and again there is some nuisance some nuance about it, right? It's not the same if the tree is very small or if the tree is big. Uh, if the tree is big and it's a huge tree and it has a hundred or, or so holes, it, it might not be affecting the tree as much as if it's very small. So, you know, in all of this, there's always something that you have to use your common sense. But yeah, we take, we take um, number of holes in one stem. That's that's our sort of um, what's the word um, category, or that's what we decided. Okay, I'm just going to interrupt for a quick second and say we are at 4:15, and we have a few, couple more questions to still answer. I'm going to put the link to our uh, feedback survey in the chat for all of you to copy down um, or open it now. And if you haven't put your full name, please add that also. We verify your registration with the name you enter here um, and your post attendee survey to show your attendance. So please do that if you haven't. And thank you all um, for being here. Uh, we are going to end exactly at 4.30, um, but we'll stay on for a few more minutes for, for questions and wrap up. So uh, Randall, go ahead. We have some questions about cleaning tools. Um, can you use pine saw to disinfect pruning tools? I haven't heard of it. Uh, so I conservatively, I say probably not, but I, I mean, doesn't mean that I haven't heard that it doesn't work. I just haven't heard of it as a good way of cleaning your tools. So I will just go for alcohol bleach or lysol and personally i prefer the alcohol because it doesn't rust your um, metal it, so so at 70 percent alcohol what i do is just put it in a spray bottle and then spray my uh, pruning tools with that that just works really good and doesn't rust your blade someone else suggests a plumber's propane torch um, this affect a handsaw in 10 seconds and then brush it off with nylon brush. Um, is that a, a good uh, technique also? Hmm. What is the name of the product? Uh, a propane torch. So you're actually burning it off, I guess. Oh. Yeah, that should probably work. I will just um, maybe brush it first and then do it. So you make sure that it, it doesn't have any pockets where the fungus can hide. But then, yeah, that, that should work as well. Okay. Um, is the um, amount of ISHB activity stabilizing, diminishing, or increasing? It depends a little bit on the area. But there is good news, actually, in um, most of the areas I've seen, um, this year I've been noticing less activity. Um, we don't know exactly why, if it's some sort of population dynamics sort of thing, you know, they grow and then they dip and then they go again. Um, if it's my hypothesis is that's more related to weather at some point, or it could be that there's some, so it could be an environmental factor, it could be some um, natural enemy that finally caught up with it. Um, we don't know, but we have noticed uh, a little bit less uh, activity. That said, it kind of depends on the area. In some areas I noticed that there's less infestation, but in some areas I'm noticing new infestations and infestations that are going, you know, growing fast. So um, it's very um, dependent on the place and the locality. 
We had one uh, person up in Kern River Valley area noting infestation and in trees that are dying. Um, do we have evidence of uh, fines in that area? Um, can someone just give me a little bit more of a, where is that? <laughs> uh, above Bakersfield. So that's, yeah. That's, um, that's. I, it could be, I am not a hundred percent sure. Um, one thing you can do is if you go to ishb.org, our webpage, and then you check on the infestation map, you can see the areas where we have a confirmed infestation, confirmed with DNA analysis, and you can see if there's anything confirmed in your area. But if you don't see it, that doesn't mean that there's nothing, that, that that's not the beetle. It just means that we didn't go there and take a sample. I would recommend you to actually contact your Act Commissioner's office and let them know about that situation. Because there's actually um, a lot of you know, um, survey and trapping going on just to figure out exactly where these beetles are. And all of that is coordinated with the Act Commissioner's Office and the UC um, offices as well. So just contact your Act Commissioners, let them know that there's an area that you suspect is infested with Shaho border. And so that will help us focus our trapping efforts or survey efforts in that area and just confirm what's going on in that place. A couple of questions about the beetles in their countries of origin. First, do they play some type of a positive role there? And secondly, are there natural enemies um, that could help in uh, eliminating them? Yeah, so in the natural um, or like the, where they're, the areas where they're native, there are natural enemies. And we have um, researchers from the UC have traveled to Taiwan and tried to, uh, Taiwan and Vietnam, and they, they're basically working on finding these natural enemies and, and try, trying to read them in the lab. So, so we know there are. And that's the idea, that's why it's on the research, right? And so we want to be able to use those natural enemies in here. The main thing is that in order to do that, you have to first uh, be able to wear the beetles in the lab, which we kind of were able to, but that took several years. And then you, be, you have to be able to wear those natural enemies in the lab, right? By infesting the beetles that you have in the lab, because you somehow you need to make a natural enemy factory in your lab. So you can make a lot of those, like it's in general our parasitoid wasps. So you need to make a lot of those wasps so you can release them. And before you can release them, you have to make sure that they won't be attacking any of the natural um, native beetles or, or, or other um, insects in the area, you don't want to introduce a new problem, right? You want to introduce a solution. So it takes a while, but yes, they are natural enemies and those are the ones that we're trying to bring back and, and rare in the lab and, and test them just to make sure they can be used as a control method. A few questions about uh, treatment of the wood waste afterwards. Um, cutting to different size chips, um, how effective is that? Um, and mm -hmm. then uh, solarization, is that also required? And does that kill the fungus as well as the beetles? Okay, so the, let's go by parts. So chipping uh, helps ki kills a bunch of the beetles, right? The smaller the chip, the better. So Ideally, you'll just do a chips that are one inch or smaller. With that, you will just get rid of almost all of the beetles. So that would be the best thing. If you can't, the smaller the chip you can get, the better. Chipping any size is always better than doing nothing. But the smaller the chip, the more control you'll get. Now, uh, with the solarization, yes, on solarization, you'll get rid of both the beetles and the fungus. 
as long as the polarization is done correctly. So for that, you remember you have to cover it with a tarp and leave it covered for enough time for the temperature under the tarp to grow enough that it will kill everything uh, and make like thin layers uh, so you get homogeneous temperatures all on in your mulch pile. You can also solarize logs the same way. You just don't don't have to stack more than two logs. And the other thing that you need to do is when you do solarization, make sure you cover everything up very well because you don't want the beetles to escape while you're trying to kill them. So if you do solarization well with chips, with logs, chips any size, it should work fine. I hope that answers the question. I don't know if I missed a part of it. Uh, or uh, not. I think that, I think that answered that. Um, a, a related question uh, is about composting and buying composted uh, wood uh, from soil uh, suppliers. Does composting kill beetles? And is there a way to find out the the uh, reputation of the soil uh, supplier as to whether they're in compliance or not? That's a great question. Um, this is the first part is almost the same. If it's well done, composting is perfect. It will kill everything. It will kill the beetles. It will kill the fungus. Um, as of when it's done correctly, there is. Um, you can find in our webpage the ishb.org that you can also. I left it in here in our. Um, woo, there, in in my last slide. Um, if you go there, you'll find there's a link. If you go into um, managing infested wood and, and the part of composting, you, there's a link to the facilities that actually are, um, they, they, they have a seal of, um, oof, I don't remember right now what is it called, but it's basically, um, it's a proof that this facility does the composting in a way that will kill everything or any pest in it. So there is some sort of um, certification that that's a good composting. So you can check that and you can check if the compost you're buying comes from one of those manufacturers. But usually if you buy compost that comes um, packaged and everything, that should be fine. Uh, several questions about the various chemical treatments available. Um, one is how specific they are. Um, and then um, another question is why do you not recommend preventative treatment? Okay, so um, the preventative treatments, I don't recommend it just because we don't have proof that it works. So um, we don't, I would not like to recommend to put pesticides in the environment if it's not really going to make any difference. Um, so we don't have any, any proof that it will work, so better not do it and just treat once it's infested. Um, in some cases, if let's say you have a heritage tree or trees like super important for your community, you might want to do some preventative treatment if you know that there's infested uh, trees around um, but it's, it's, I'll, I'll say probably better not to. Um, regarding the specificity of the treatments, uh, they are not particular specific for this, uh, beetle. So the, the, the insecticides are just kill insects uh, more generally. So that's why you want to time the treatments when the beetles are flying. So if you're going to do a trunk spray, you'll do it when the beetles are dispersing and you'll be avoiding doing it during the flowering of that tree if that tree is um, pollinated by um, bees. So those are some of the things that any um, arborist will probably know about this. Uh, and then the other thing is that it, once you spray, it's, just, um, it's usually just on the bark. So you won't be 
affecting that much of anything that's happening in the leaves. So um, that's it. that's the good thing. But yes, you have to spray when the beetles are are um, flying, and when the bees are not in your tree. Thanks so much. Um, I hate to interrupt the fun, and we do have a few unanswered questions, but I will follow up uh, via email with all of you to hopefully answer anything unanswered. Um, please uh, do our follow-up survey and uh, CEUs will be available. They're taking at least a couple weeks just to put out to all of you now. So um, be patient and thank you. And thank you, Dr. Nobuo Berman for being here and talking about um, invasive shot hole borers and fusarium with us.